Running our own business isn't easy and it can be a tough gig for all of us at times and only other business owners truly understand the challenges that we face. And on Scale Up Radio, we aim to help make things just that little bit easier by interviewing guests who have been where you are now, regardless of where you are on the Scale Up journey, and maybe facing some of the challenges that you are facing. And they offer their thoughts and advice on what has worked well for them as well as what didn't, of course. And we've also combined many of these lessons into a practical scale-up handbook called the Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System. And there's details of this at the end of the episode. So welcome to Scale-Up Radio. So welcome to another episode of Scale-Up Radio. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Campbell and Ross Latter, who are co-founders of Macrofin. So Stephen and Ross, welcome. Thank you. Good. So Stephen, first, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us what um, Macrofin is all about? Yes, so I am Stephen Campbell, so one of the co-founders. Um, my background prior to starting Macrofin was that I was an accountant for over 10 years. Prior to that, I had a master's in computer programming back in Ireland. Uh, worked at PwC as well for a couple of years in audit, uh, and then worked as an accountant. Because of my IT background, I did a lot of implementations of different systems. Um, and then we focus at Macrofin on NetSuite. I did NetSuite twice as a customer myself. So I, I never had a very good experience of a lot of those implementations. Um, the main reason being that the people implementing weren't from a finance background. And so the training that people would get wasn't, they, while they understood the system, they didn't know how, how people used it day to day. And so we kind of thought that we could bring a different mindset to the implementation um, by having accountants implement the system. Uh, and that's how Macrofin was born. And I had that was the original idea. I reached out to Ross um, and yeah, Macrofin was born. I'll let Ross kind of introduce his background. Right, yeah. Ross, over, over to you. Right. And so my background started my career in accounting as well. Um, had an affinity for that early on. Uh, spent five years in professional practice and I moved over from Australia to London. It's where I first met Steve in 2011. Um, okay. We worked at company called Shed Media. They'd just been purchased by Warner Brothers and going through a transition to migrate off uh, their old system onto SAP. So it was our first exposure to a large scale transformation project like that. And I think we both really enjoyed that exposure that we got. Um, we both got a very good mind for process, how it can operate, pitfalls within an organization's process. Uh, I then moved back to Australia, um, worked, worked at a large telecoms company, Telstra, where I, I managed um, finance teams Managed them through a lot of change and transformation. So I got a lot of experience managing the people side of uh, digital transformation, uh, leading teams through that and also project management experience. Um, and I studied a, a master's of business at Melbourne Business School. And I knew I really wanted to work in my own business one day. And I thought I could apply a lot of my operational sales and finance skills to a business and needed a good idea to come along. Uh, and the timing worked well when Steve reached, reached out in 2018 with the idea. Um, so it was a great idea and I was keen to move back over to London to work with Steve and grow the business. Um, so right. now at Macrofin, I'm a CEO and I oversee the operations and the marketing and the finance function of Macrofin. Brilliant. And so you're the, you take on a CEO role. So what, Stephen, what's your, what's your role? I was chief solution architect now. So I, I, I'm heavily involved during the sales process. So okay. because I can, having been an accountant and having the IT knowledge, I can explain the finance pieces to CFOs who might be a bit unsure on the system, but then any technical questions from CTOs maybe, I can answer that as well. And especially if they're trying to integrate different systems, I can apply a lot of knowledge to that as well. So right. quite comfortable around that. And is that how you split the roles right from the from the get-go? It, it was actually, we actually were, Kind of, we've, we've swapped roles quite early on um, oh. we we had Ross um, more pegged for being the sales and I was going to be the one doing the projects because that was my background and I was kind of implementing things um, myself but as we kind of started we saw there was value to having me at that stage and kind of as a kind of architect of like designing the solutions um, that we were going to be implementing and helping the sales uh, teams at NetSuite uh, and then Ross obviously then brought probably had more value for it, brought to kind of building up the team and kind of the accounts and um, everything else that he does as part of his CEO role. Great. And are you able to keep those 
um, kind of keep those lanes nice and separate and stick to your own lanes or is it, how's it working? I, I do joke that I've been on my own at Lyland a lot <laughs> as we've kind of gone because I do the sales and then pass it over to Ross and Ross is kind of responsible for them, <laughs> every, and the team and the team are yeah. kind of responsible for everything else. Yeah. Right. Good. And and what sort of stage? Uh, we'll come back in a minute to some of the some of the stages as you've grown. But how would you describe where the business is at at the at, at the moment? Maybe in terms of the number, the size of the team, the kind of clients you're working with. What sort of stage are you are you at with the business after four years or so? Yeah. So we've we've grown very rapidly over the last four years. So um, the last two years we've doubled in our revenue, um, doubled the team size. So we're now up to a team of thirty five people. Um, I think it's a good stable level that we're at. We've got a great balance now of pr strong principal consultants to lead the projects and design and manage each client's project, supported by functional consultants who know NetSuite inside out to build the technical aspects of the system. Uh, and then we, we support them with project managers, experienced system accountants to help provide more well-rounded advice and apply that sort of finance expertise, which is our USP to each project. And then, have built the sort of support services within the business around resource planning, you know, billing, finance, marketing, and sales to su supplement that, that the business and bring that work yeah. in to keep our team busy. So I think we're at a really good size now where we, we do four times as many implementations in UK and Europe as the next nearest sort of alliance partner of NetSuite. Okay. So we're in a very strong position um, at the moment. And, and Steve, maybe tell us a little bit about NetSuite and, and, and what it is, because I'm sure we're not all familiar with what NetSuite does. Yeah, so it's um, I mean, the position as the number one kind of cloud ERP. They were they started over 20 years ago alongside Salesforce. They both both as uh, founders came out of the uh, came out of Oracle and set up Salesforce and NetSuite. They they built up over years. Oracle then uh, uh, bought them about six years ago, and since then, put a lot more investment into it. Um, it's so it's geared at the mid market, um, mid market. So any the majority of our clients are people coming off zero, coming off QuickBooks. They're having problems with consolidation, and they're, they're going into different countries. Their billing might be becoming more complex, and you need a better system to be able to do that. Yeah. And one of the things about NetSuite then as well, you shouldn't ever have to change from it, even though it's geared at the mid-market, there are enterprise sized clients on it um, as well. And just what the, a big game changer that, they, that NetSuite did around six years ago, just a, about when we started, was they brought out a thing called Sweet Success, which is they created verticalized versions of it. Before it was very open, you could build, you built whatever you needed on it, but now they have like a software version. Uh, and it's got all the reports, the dashboards, and the functionality pretty much already set up for you when you buy it. So what you see in a demo, you get straight away. It makes our lives much easier as well to implement. It's going to cut that in half, cut the cost in half as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a, that's then made it really ramp up over the last couple of years. Um, especially we work a lot in the software and um, um, fintech kind of space. So and it fits very, very nicely there. And when you say mid mid market mid tier, what what does that mean? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you. So we sort of turn over from a ten million to two hundred. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a good yeah. range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. I think you can go higher. I think you can go higher. I think Oracle have maybe rules or does Oracle have a product, an enterprise level product, uh, Fusion, which was up to for the higher. But there's nothing stopping you using NetSuite, if, if, even if you are bigger. So you're dealing with the finance director and the finance teams, are you in those in those companies essentially? Nearly, nearly always. There, there will be times that the CTO might uh, come along, maybe if there's integrations, but it, it's very different to kind of how, let's say you're buying SAP, where you'd have an on, uh, a, a, you need a server to to host everything, but because it's all cloud based, there's very little for the IT team to be involved. Um, so it's nearly always the finance team who would be making the decisions around this and will be the ones who are uh, doing the day-to-day -day work. Great. And how does the, Ross, how does the business model work? How do you make how do you make your money? Is it all consulting fees? How does it split? Yeah, so it's all on the consulting fees and we're split between the upfront project to implement NetSuite yeah. and then 
any secondary projects which might come later in phase two once you're live and then manage service support for the clients once they're live on a monthly subscription where you get a number of hours per month. Uh, and then you've got the core NetSuite build and then the phase two might be enhancing it to build more automation or build integrations to other systems. Um, so they're the type of services we provide to give that full uh, scope to get the most yeah. out of NetSuite you can having that core functionality in place up front and then training your team to use all of its advanced functionality and then connecting it to other systems that you use. Uh, and in terms of uh, the profitability of the business, it's you know, the key economic drivers are the capacity of the team and making sure that's lined up to the work we have and getting that headcount right. They need to drive the utilization of the team members to hit those KPIs in terms of productivity each month that I'm planning the business around. Yeah. And making sure the work they do on a client is actually billable work. You know, if we always want to be helpful to the client, but there's a limit beyond that work now out of scope and the client should be approving to pay for that before we start the work so you don't have revenue leakage. And if, if, I'm, if I'm driving all those economic drivers, those three or four things, the rest of the, the business takes care of itself. If I'm monitoring those, I know it'll be profitable. Great. So you get you get a nice bit of upfront upfront consulting income. You've then got that tail of recurring revenue. I would imagine it's fairly once you've implemented a, a, a system within a company, I would imagine it's fairly sticky with the with, with the business. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was one of our mottos to empower the, the client's users to be able to use their system and not be dependent on consultants. So if they've got sort of straightforward requirements that, that won't change in the near future. They probably don't need much post go live support from us because we'll empower them to use everything they can in that system and not need us afterwards. Only when they right. have a more project based work to enhance the system. Um, but for some clients need the support or they've got lots of automation and change they want to make, or they have core finance team members move on before the project's over. So we're there to help handhold them and guide them through that speed and make sure it's embedded within their team. The training was really important to us when we were starting out because that was just something I saw. Um, working as an accountant contractor kind of for a couple of years, I could just see no matter what the system is, people weren't getting the most out of it. So we wanted to try and make sure that people could use these. They're investing a lot of money in it. And if you can't use it properly, you're not going to get that return on your investment. Yeah, good. And you mentioned um, that there are other uh, other implementers uh, around. What makes you different then from the other from the other people that are, that are partnered with uh, NetSuite? Uh, it's well for us it's, it's the accounting experience um i, I just there there may there are probably are, are other partners who will have accountants and say they have the accounting experience but I, no one else has started from two accountants who with no project no consulting experience behind them starting a business and deciding we could we wanted to try and do it better uh, and where we when we're when we are implementing we We've got a team of accountants within the team and former end users, so they we can apply their knowledge. It can be very hard starting a project to know when you've never used the system before to know exactly what you want. And I can see how this holds up a project because you can't make right. a decision, whereas yeah. you can rely on us and say we can tell you this is the best way. This is how we used it ourselves, and yeah. it just speeds everything up. And that's. That's why we can get so many clients live really, really quickly uh, and de-risk the project, help with their data. Again, we're, we're accountants, we, we appreciate it. I'm sure like, it's quite easy for, to hear stories all the time of really bad data going in because they don't appreciate how important it is. But again, being accountants, that's important. If you don't get that right, it makes everything really stressful. So it, it really is the accounting um, experience and being end users of the system as well and applying that. Yeah, I think we, we can bring so much more empathy to the client situation. And we're both empathetic people to start with. So we can put ourselves in their shoes. We can picture the role of the accounts payable clerk and the person doing the billing or the controller trying to prepare the board reports or the CFO. And we can empathize with them and their obstacles they have every day. And then we can help build the system to help them. We can help suggest things they might not have thought of yet or relate to challenges that they will have to give them the best advice. And, and we then, that sort of empathetic approach, we've trained our team to take that approach as well uh, throughout the project. The, you know, the projects can be challenging. There's a lot of demands on the client team to find time to help 
design their system, prepare their data and be trained up on the system. And so we really appreciate they've got a lot going on in a finance team, especially if it's a fast growing scaling business as well. So we tailor the project timeline and the meetings that we schedule and the scope of the project to help facilitate that um, and avoid any issues or you know, risk of the project failing. So, um, ERP projects are challenging and you read stats that like a high number of them aren't successful, something like 75%, which scares people off starting the ERP project. But with us, we've got a 100% success rate of clients okay. going live, being able to post their accounts and their transactions in a reconciled system. Yeah, there, there are lots of frightening statistics, aren't there, around any change management type programs with very high failure rates. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's, that's impressive if you've got 100% success rate. Clearly, clearly very impressive. There's a little bit of element if you need to protect the client from themselves. If if they've bought the out-of-the-box leading practices and then two months later they're asking for all these changes in this perfect system, yeah. we will stand firm and say, no, we do not recommend this. We, we don't let them sort of get their way um, okay. in terms of how they'll build it, and which means they're probably more successful because they'll get live on NetSuite, but the core functionality will will add those things to phase two later. And I do think the clients appreciate us taking a firm stance to guide them and lead them through the project rather than just doing everything they ask for, which might actually be adding a lot of risk or cost or lengthening the project timeline. Great. And Stephen, what are some of the what are some of the key reasons why people want to move from from zero? Then you mentioned a couple before, but zero or QuickBooks and, and use a system like NetSuite. What's the what are they what are the clients looking to achieve? Well, from a finance, they're just so they're struggling with consolidation. Is is one of the yeah. biggest ones? Yeah. They're they're they they're scaling really quickly. They're going into other markets in the EU. Like so many of the businesses that we work with, will have three or four uh, entities in other countries. Yeah. Um, and and w when you do that in zero, you've got to buy separate instances of zero, and then you've got to do it with a different tool, which isn't really a full consolidation tool. Um, and so NetSuite can do this. It's one of the, most, the best parts of NetSuite. It's actually quite unimpressive to dem demo because it just works. In <laughs> older systems, you had to run the consolidation. It isn't yeah. something you have to run anymore. It, yeah. it just is there. Your, your numbers are always there. Um, and then the other thing is, a, is around the billing, um, with especially around software fintech. You've got you might have companies billing on usage, different ratings, and they they're not going to get anything like that from from zero, they might get it from a separate system, but you then end up with lots of different systems and yeah. it can be hard kind of getting them all connected together. And you can still do that with NetSuite and use other tools, but NetSuite is so much more powerful than zero and it's probably a better hub to kind of connect those other systems if that is the route you wanted to go down. But I say billing and consolidation are the big ones and probably then procurement, if they want to bring in a more um, stringent procurement process. Um, bringing in purchase orders and things like that. Uh, it's, it's quite common that people decide to do that once they move to NetSuite. Right. Good. So quite a quite a leap of faith and, and, and trust, Ross, in coming over from Australia to to partner with with Stephen. So what gave you the what gave you the confidence that uh, that this is going to work out? Uh, well, well, my wife and I always wanted to move back to the UK and it was hard to get a visa. So we kind of joked that it was a, a scheme <laughs> to get a visa and it turned into a successful business. Um, so it, my, my confidence was in a lot of trust in Steve's sort of technical knowledge. Uh, he'd, he'd worked with a lot of different systems and seen various systems and a lot of confidence in NetSuite. Uh, I think I had to myself get up to speed with the system. Uh, but, but stepping out to start your own consultancy without really knowing how rapid the market will grow and how good the competition is was, was a big risk. Um, it was a risk as I was willing to take to have an opportunity to start my own business. Um, yeah. and, and at worst case, I would have learned a lot about starting your own business to maybe do it again one day. You'd, you'd learn a lot from if it failed. But I'd pick up a lot of skills around system transformation, which I think is for a finance professional, really good skills to have in your own career. Um, you've got to move away from just doing reporting and forecast models in Excel. If you want to really want to have a, a strong, successful career and keep up to date with technology that's moving, you've got to really be system minded and digital transformation capable and willing to embark on those type of projects. So I'll, either way, I was going to get a lot of experience out of it and a new skill set. Right. Right. I justified the, the risk. 
Yeah, Ross is very optimistic as well. It's we have a very good balance, and that I'm very pessimistic. Ross is really optimistic. Okay. My pessimism is great for working out processes and why they fail, and just, I'm I'm always seeing problems and things. Yeah. But Ross has been, and so we we balance each other off really um, well. As if if there was two of me trying to start the business, it would it wouldn't have gone anywhere because we would have talked ourselves out of it. Um, but I think that was really that really helped us when we were starting, and still now. Great. And what sort of things did you think about from a le- legal agreement perspective when you when you set up the business, a co- co-founder agreement? What did you what did you do that way? I recall researching and a lot, a lot of advice is be like really careful on a 50-50 partnership because you've got no way to resolve disputes without like a tiebreaker in there. But we had no other sort of reason not to do to do it differently and no third party to bring in. So there's a lot, a lot of trust between us. To really talk through any major issues that we would have a disagreement on um so we, yeah, we went to 50 50 in our shareholder agreement but um it's worked out well we're like we're very open with each other about our challenges and issues we have you know, coaching and feedback on each other to be better at our own jobs um we don't sort of have egos or defensiveness that would ever block taking that feedback on from our business partner so i think yeah. that's why it's contributed to us being like successful partners together brilliant Good. And and Stephen, you know, if you if you say you've got the sort of pessimistic, more cautious view on view on life, were there any things that you um that you wanted to think about and make sure were in that shareholders agreement in the in the eventuality of anything in the future not working out? To be honest, I I I trust Ross so much. I just leave all that stuff to Ross. To be honest. Ah, he, might be, he might be uh, ripping me off somehow, but I I'm I, I have actually complete faith in him. So um, I, I was kind of, okay, once we agreed to 50-50, I was just happy to get him on board um, to get started with. Um, cause we did, I, I was talking to other people as well, but like Ross was so much more committed to everything. So I was just ha- happy to get him back uh, over yeah. as his teacher. We worked together and we knew each other really well. So yeah, I was right. happy to go. And did you, did you need to bring any money either of you to put, or both of you to put into the business or was it fairly, fairly cash positive from the start? We, we didn't bring anything. We just started. I was working on some contracts at the time. Um, uh, I initially just actually wanted training in NetSuite while I was working on that contract and got speaking to the Alliance Partnership Manager instead um, by mistake. Um, and so that's yeah. how that came about. But yeah, we didn't. Uh, while I was just doing that contract, I picked up another contract. Um, Ross got a contract and then we started working with NetSuite while doing these contracts and slowly started to pick things up. It was very busy, obviously, trying to work multiple things at the same time. But as we got in with NetSuite, then we were able to pull back uh, on those things and then properly get started. Probably if we would do something again with a bit of hindsight, knowing our idea did work, was maybe put some funding in to hire experienced people, like a project manager to help keep us organized or a quite ex- a very experienced NetSuite consultant. Um, but mm. when we were self-funded, we were doing a lot ourselves and just every hire was sort of a gradual step. Um, yep. But then you were kind of, when we got really busy because what we were offering was very attractive to the market, we were then chasing our tail and it was always hard to hire experienced enough people to help manage the workload we had. So we were always playing that so chasing our tail game for the first mm-hmm. few years. Um, and, and it's sort of it's a hard market to predict our pipeline because they're, they're large projects that, there's not very long pipeline of when they will start. Sometimes clients are like, I just got funding. I need to start this project in the next month or two. Um, you don't really have a long lead time to know what your pipeline will be like. So sometimes yeah. you have to move quickly, hire quickly, or just start the project and Steve and I will roll our sleeves up and get in to do it ourselves if we have to. Yeah. yeah. And what what was the, what sort of discussions did you have around um, actually um, putting all your eggs in the NetSuite bas- basket, if, if, if you like, because there's pros and cons to that, isn't there? You know, it enables you to kind of grow with NetSuite, all the advantages and things that they've got as they as they go it helps you. But equally, you have got all your eggs in the in, in the one basket. What what sort of thinking did you do around that at the beginning? So I had used other systems. I liked. I, I ended up on one of my contracts just before starting Microfin doing. Uh, they chose NetSuite as their system, and so I implemented that. Um, and then the next contract that I had, um, NetSuite was the best system I had used um, of, of all of the of all the previous systems. So then when I went to my next contract, we ended up picking NetSuite again. 
So I, I, I my mindset that stage was NetSuite was the best system. And like the, their growth since then has kind of probably backed up that they, especially with the sweet success model that they have, it, they've ramped up massively over the last couple of years. Um, so it was a good choice, but it, it, it came from my own experience of using it. Yeah. Anything you'd add to that, Ross? Well, we realized after a while, a lot of the value we brought was actually the implementation methodology. Yep. So the, the good plan, good tools to deliver it, understanding the processes, data migration, not necessarily system specific. So if, if NetSuite went out of favor or other system came up to overtake, we could probably shift our model onto another system. So we always had that ability to, I think, the value we bring okay. could apply yep. to other systems. Um, but we, we knew NetSuite we were investing heavily in their, their sales representatives around 2018, 19. So they were expected to grow. So that, that's why we made that choice. And I think there's a lot of benefit in just focusing on one system and learning that really well and becoming an expert in that system. Yeah. Also helps build trust with NetSuite that we're only focused on one system and not others. Excellent. So what have been some of the, in the four or five years that you've been running the business, what have been some of the key key milestones, the key inflection points so far? Uh, this might not be the first one, but I remember one where we, where we signed 10 jobs in the same month <laughs> where it was like so we were we were ticking along at one or two maybe three and then all of a sudden they all converged together and that obviously required a lot of hiring but we had to in the background we were very proud we we're very proud of the fact that we've constantly evolved how we deliver and the tools we use and um, so we use a tool called ClickUp, and um, which is a project management tool really flexible um yeah. and i I was a productivity nerd before and tried them all and like this one. Um, but we had a model for how we were managing the projects and with, with the scale we were going to have to uh, deliver these, it was like, we've got to make this better because if we're going to manage this, because the people we hire aren't going to be skilled up probably 100% in time, we need to make it easier for them. And so we spent a month, month and a half, uh, working on how to make our delivery model better and completely redesigning how ClickUp was to make it much easier for people to follow. And that basically allowed us to then handle that number of jobs. And that's obviously, we since then, we're obviously always delivering a lot of jobs, but that point folk really focused on um, not perfecting it, but yeah, as close as yeah. we could. We're off the back of that 10 and then some others that signed in a, Three month period from a December to February, I think year before last, we delivered 14 go lives. And we found out that was a record across all of EMEA to do that many in that shorter period of time. And I know in other consultancies, when they have two in a month, it's like a big deal, all hands on deck. And our process to deliver them at, at scale, at volume, with high quality, and that nailed the financial cutover uh, was a testament to what we built beforehand and the training we delivered to the team. So that was a really important milestone and, and for Thank me you. being able to actually big stepping stone was when i had projects that would be delivering i barely got involved in I, I didn't even need to know much about them like the, the process we'd built and the training of the consultants meant they could run it themselves and actually could just step back and go that's how they're doing that delivery is everything we came up with running itself now so for me that was a big moment as well Great. So you still managed to get Christmas lunch in that period from December to February. Did you with that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, yeah, so so let's talk about the people a little bit then, because that's obviously been a, a bit of a rate limiting step for you. You must be finding finding the right sort of people. So how do you go about finding good people to work with you? You've scaled quickly to 35. So how, how have you gone about finding them? Um, We've... Use like the recruiters in the market. Um, I think it's like a special skill set that's needed to target the right consultants. So we work with um, some preferred agencies we have trust a relationship with. They know what type of candidates we need. Um, so they, they find strong candidates with NetSuite experience. Um, we've got quite a robust interview process to test out their good cultural fit for the team, um, but also got strong NetSuite knowledge that they can apply. Uh, and we, we also do look for a unique mix of people with that finance background, end user background have been in the client's shoes as well to, to build that team of technical accountants that can really sit down and relate to the client's challenges and help design the system to suit them. Um, and then we've had a lot of people want to join us just through word of mouth of hearing that we're a great partner to work for. Um, we spend a lot of time on making sure we've got a really good culture and people are looked after and good career progression. 
you know, consulting is like a challenging business. You've got lots of clients mm -hmm. on. It can be quite demanding. Sometimes it can be a bit rude. It can be a bit stressful. So we really take a lot of care to look after the people to have a um, good retention rate because consulting is rewarding. You learn so much. You work with different projects and different people, but it is it's demanding. So we try to balance that out for our team. What sort of what sort of things do you do to help to balance that out and build that culture? Um, yeah, so we, we're very like flexible on holidays and extra time off over summer. We support for all their training that, that they want to do, um, especially during the Zoom period. We were like very collaborative, like the team meetings, getting to know each other. Um, so everyone feels like quite tight knit. And now we're back in the office. We make sure we have like regular team lunches, team drinks, team events to make sure they're sort of bonding and feel like it's a great environment to work for. And yeah, we're really fostering a lot of collaboration between the teams to help each other out on their projects, share knowledge. So I think this all around makes a great environment for the team to work in. As Ross said earlier, we're really empathetic um, to people, which is why we kind of got into it, trying to fix things, but even just to our staff as well, like as if there's very little overtime kind of done in our business. We try to keep like okay. people working their hours and that should be enough and that's how we um, schedule things. Hmm. And how do you test for that empathy in the recruitment process then and the fit, the general fit that you're looking for? I honest, that's like the, the challenging part of recruitment. And you know, we've had some hires that have not worked out and not been that right fit, we find out later. So um, yeah, I, have, I probably don't have nailed that piece yet, but we are sort of working on that. Um, we put some more, some more psychometric testing in place. Um, but it, it generally is just through conversations and, testing them under a bit of pressure during the interview to see how they do react and handle pressure. Um, but I do find it challenging to really judge those factors in just one or two meetings that you might have with a candidate. Yeah. And because we're, we're usually hiring after we've won the work, which has been <laughs> the way I think most consultancies kind of work anyway, unless you've got some funding, there's a bit yeah. more pressure on trying to get someone in, but you can't maybe always be as picky um, as we would possibly be if we had a lot more time with it yes there's always that danger isn't there if it's like going um people advise you not to go shopping when you're hungry because you just end up picking all the all the rubbish food off the, yeah, off the exactly. shelves <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah but yeah. Said, we, we do figure that out pretty quickly whether they'll fit um we are quite demanding that we, we set we set out to be the best at, yeah. the, at doing implementation and so we need really good people and that's ross has really built up a very good team um yeah great and, and what sort of things do you do to is you you you, you say you use you use um um click up you've got 35 people on multiple projects how are you how are you keeping control of it all and making sure that everything's going the right way right direction as well as not dropping any plates uh as you go um yes yeah, so it's it's using tools and systems in a consistent process so we're sort of adamant when new people come on no matter what tools or systems or ways they've worked before, you need to work to our way. And we've been very open to other opinions on how to do it better. And when we've had ideas from the team, we're very quick to roll them out if we think they'll improve. But we do expect collaboration, use the tools consistently so that we've got 15 or 20 projects on the go. We can go to ClickUp, go to the project dashboard, know it's up to date, know how they're tracking. Um, and then I, with the sort of the high level business plan I have, and the metrics we need to hit to perform, I make sure they flow down into the manager's KPIs and individual people's KPIs about you know, the productivity rates and the quality of the projects you deliver. They're sticking to budget on projects, getting a high rate of um, sort of positive customer feedback. So that all then flows down into individual staff's performance plans so that what they, it's really clear to them what they need to be working towards, which is the right behaviors we want to help the business be successful. Great. Right. And how does the organizational structure look then with 35, 35 people? Yeah, so we've got um, uh, managers who look after the professional service, who sort of, uh, manage the, the project managers, uh, manage support function, uh, and our functional delivery resources. So uh, Alison, our head of professional services, looks after that team. Uh, and then Graham, he's responsible for the actual delivery of each project and being the sponsor on those projects. And so the principal consultants who lead those projects end to end work under him. And then the other resources then feed in to supplement Graham. And then and Charlotte heads up our technical services team. And that's where we have former accountants 
who have been through a NetSuite project before in their previous roles are very good with data and accounting process and billing to provide that advice and, and, a, and the development team for the integration work. So we've got, got managers um, in these positions that are really clear on what their team needs to do to plug into each project to make it successful. Um, but they're also great at like managing the individual people in their team. Uh, we spent a lot of time coaching our managers on how to manage their staff and be empathetic leaders, but sort of you know, demand a strong performance from their their people. And how do you balance, Stephen, how do you balance that time then? Because as you say it's demanding, there, there's projects that need to be done, need to get over the over the deadline, and yet you also want to spend the time training and um and doing the cultural side of things. How do you how do you manage to get that balance? Ross, would, is more you again? Yeah, sorry, well, my, <laughs> yeah, probably uh, more of so, Ross. Yeah, yeah we, we we work out like fair targets on how many billable hours they should be doing. Um, but it's like a very reasonable number that then has enough time for them to do their study and training. So okay. we, when they want to do new courses, we, we allow some of their hours during work hours to be allocated to that. Plus do some in your own time for your professional development. Um, so we're quite flexible in giving enough time for them to do these extra things. Because I know that if they're doing great quality work efficiently, because they're well-trained and collaborate, the business will be successful and yeah. i feel like a competitive advantage that we've built is i've made the timesheet entry tool as seamless as possible to minimize that admin which is necessary and consulting make that as quick as possible it gives me great insight to help people hit their targets and build the revenue that they've done and so if you have a really good culture there then no one needs to work over time because we've got a great sort of margin um plus we can probably be more competitive on the pricing as well so we've sort of tightly ran all these parts of the business with good systems and tools and data yeah. and everyone wins. The client wins, the staff win, and, and Matt, Steve and I win around the margin of the business that we make. Very good. So what you've obviously had some really, really great success. What would you, what would you say are some of the key factors that have led to that success so far? Key things you've got right, maybe. I think the idea was a good one. <laughs> so I yeah. think that was proven to be right. Um, as Ross said, I think we're doing is it, so many more jobs than uh, any other kind of NetSuite Alliance partner uh, here in, in EMEA. Um, and that's based on the idea we had of accountants doing systems. I think it just, we had the idea at the right time where NetSuite had got to the stage of a sweet success that you didn't have to be um, a, a technical person to be able to do it. You could do 90% of it without it. There might be there were small parts of it that you might need more um uh, uh, tech knowledge um but the majority of it wasn't so as i just the actual idea um i think as it having me um selling as well like it just being available around that and um, during the pre-sales to kind of get uh clients at ease and put their trust in us and that they will have a successful implementation and um, was a good decision i think as well Correct. I think we're also, Steve mentioned, like we're we're quick to adapt and uh, change our process to improve it. So we've always had the same vision and goal to be the best at implementing the ERP software, but like how we got there's constantly changed. So like how we structure the project or the mix of people or how we price it. We react yep. very quickly to feedback to always be improving to help us get to that, that point. Um, so I think that's how it's helped to stay ahead of the competition. So while we can scale, deliver more projects, also the quality is getting better and the customer feedback gets better. Um, so we're always working on improving. We don't just stay static and go, this yeah. is the business model, too hard to change it anymore. Yeah. But it does, yeah. as we got bigger though, we did have to balance off constantly changing how we do things every month or two. It was a bit easier when we were 10 people and you can just work with every person one-on-one -on -one to help them adapt. We did have to find a balance of having stability if you've got an idea to change something, let's not just be constantly changing because it's hard for the people. They need a bit of consistency yeah. as well for their own sake. Good. And and if with a bit of hindsight, you know, what sort of things would you would you do differently if you were to oh yeah, with that with that hindsight benefit of? I think we said um, we've discussed this ourselves a few times that we would have hired a probably would have invested a bit quicker yeah. as I said yeah. earlier. I'll probably get the project management experience in. Um, I think this was something that I said when I was going through projects as more of the functional person myself, I maybe questioned what the project managers were actually contributing. 
Um, and so, I, yeah, we didn't have the best opinion of what project managers did. But then when we started delivering all these projects and the more we were doing, I started to understand that just being functional, even when I was doing contracting myself, I I wanted to kind of do too much almost. Uh, and you, you need someone monitoring the project, helping with the change management aspect, as you even mentioned, change management earlier. That's so important to the project and the project managers can um, can handle a lot of that. And so I think we, we should have hired that a bit quicker. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, that's the service point, like it's something I see in some of the, the vendors we work with for our services, and it can be great at the technical aspect of what you provide. But if you're not organized and the client doesn't know who's doing what, who's what steps are needed, when's it due by, you can really diminish the service in the eyes of your customer. Mm-hmm. And so just just being organized, being clear, taking charge and leading the client you're consulting for through it rather than them yeah. chasing you and them leading you makes such a big difference. And it's not that hard to do. You don't have to be technical on it. You just have the, the right people who are organized and planning ahead for the client. And yeah, we, we took that feedback on very early on. And now I think it's a real strength to come to not sort of undermine all the hard work you do on the technical aspect yeah. of consulting or just poor project management or organizational skills. Yeah. And I can see how that, you know, you've mentioned a couple of times that because of the fact that you're both accountants, you both got that financial background, you're able to really hold the client's hand through the process and guide them as opposed to just responding because they say they want so want something or, or, or some change or whatever, you can actually guide them properly. And that improves not only the client experience at the end of the day, because as you say, you get it implemented, they get something that works, that, that, that fits, the, fits the needs, but it means that it's much more efficient for you. You're not chasing off down different paths. You're basically yeah. following a straight path through. Yeah, very good. Probably other, other thing in hindsight we should have gone on to earlier is building more of a robust sales and marketing engine up front. Um, so we did work closely with NetSuite as a partner. A lot of leads would come from them. Okay. So we did grow rapidly with them because we really sort of try to help out the, the sales reps at NetSuite to help them win their deals by providing all the value add Steve provides. So we were working closely with them, but then we are very beholden to the fluctuations of NetSuite yeah. and relationships with individual sales reps. And so if there is like a dip um, for whatever reason of leads through NetSuite, we're a little bit exposed. Um, so this so year we've you... invested in experienced yeah. sales managers ramped up right. our marketing efforts so that yeah. we are more in control of our own pipeline. So I can have like a, a, a longer pipeline, like wider funnel, seeing leads mm-hmm. working through it much further in advance to help me plan headcount and resource. Um, Great. And and what's the... What sort of marketing strategies work best for you then beyond beyond the relationship straight with NetSuite people? But uh, what sort of things work for you finding finding good clients? Yeah, it, it'd be doing like a, a very good job with the client, but like leading firmly seems to earn the most respect from the yeah. clients. And then you know, the referrals from those CFOs right. to other yeah. CFOs, or they often move on to other businesses. And then especially a CFO working a private equity backed business, they often do move around to get the business from stage A to stage B, stage C. If they've worked with us and enjoy working with us, they know they can bring us in to do it again, even better and quicker and can trust us. Um, and we, we try to buy a lot of case studies, present at webinars, um, get our name out there. Um, and we've, we've, we've hosted or presented at um, several events like Accountex and World Finance yep. Forum. Um, it could take a bit longer to get leads in through those events because people have to be ready to buy next week but it's, it's, i've noticed that getting our name out there is having an impact on leads that then come through our website later on or through referrals yeah building that credibility good yeah, yeah. So- really sort of yeah, the relationship with people in these businesses they know when they're ready to make the step on the erp project they know who to come to and Stephen, what do you love most about what you what you do um I suppose the freedom. I, I think the reason we got it, I, I got out of finance was I I I love I love fixing processes and things like that. And so I, I could get to a stage where I, I on a particular contract, I, I got their month end down from four weeks to a couple of days, um, just with different building macros and things like that. But I couldn't get rid of month end completely. It still had to be done. And I 
we personally just found it a bit mundane doing the same thing oh it would come around every year you're doing that budget season and so I, I need to be doing something different and so every project is different every client has new requirements and you also you get um i get more of a good feeling from actually delivering we start something we finish it and go there you go there's your system whereas when you are more working in finance it's there's you don't have that kind of thing that you've delivered and yeah. so that, that for me is what i get out of it yeah how about you russ um yeah i'll say it's delivering a value to our clients so they're, they're paying us for a service but we're really helping them along their journey like we're setting them up for success so their investment in our services pays off you know, five tenfold for them down the line so i enjoy that mutual benefit we have in our relationship with our clients uh, and then working with my team coaching them developing them seeing them run their own projects solve their own problems themselves without as much support from steve and myself i'm very proud of that when i see that happen from our team yeah great and what's the what's the long-term aim you're obviously building a really successful business what's the what's the long-term goal well it's to continue doing what we're doing and continue to be better at it um we want to see steady growth uh, year on year we want to work in different verticals of netsuite offer extended services and in our integration capabilities and further advice um you know, pot potential expansion across europe as well potentially into the US, there's some of the, the plans ahead of us. Um, it may, may eventually, it might be like an exit available to us as well based on the business that we've built. Um, but we just continue to work hard on making the successful, profitable business, which is good for us right now, yep. and hopefully pay off down the line right. as well. So if we're, if we're catching up in another four or five years' time, what does, what does good look like for you? Yeah, Steve, do you want to lots of time on the golf course? I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I suppose yeah, just having as like almost what we have now is the business kind of running itself. It would be um, with, we're expanding into these other um, so sort of different verticals within NetSuite. So that's we've added. We're working out with inventory and manufacturing businesses. We've yeah. added that capability. We brought in someone with fifteen years' experience this year to expand that. There is an additional billing tool that we've added. So which again, we've only started doing those. So if we're seeing those grow as well uh, and just having a sustainable business that we, we know is running and doesn't require us to be so quite so involved, as Ross said, I, I wouldn't mind spending some time on the golf course as well as working. Yeah, that, that that's the goal uh, is when big things go wrong and was, or big crises come up, you know, a key person leaves or you know, a deal's not going well, like you've, you've you don't want everything to be like a panic. You want to be able to sort of, we want to get to the point where we're kind of relaxed. We yeah. go on holidays, we know when we come back, things are fine, the team work together to solve the problems. That would be the goal because yeah, when you have your own business, it's, it's always on your mind. Um, you sort of yeah. go to bed yeah. th thinking about it, waking up thinking about it, and eventually that does start to wear you down. So you do need yeah, that balance to enjoy yeah, it. That's and what, what, what might so what might some of your big challenges be? What might get in the way of, of getting to that point with the business? Uh, it could be like the relationship with NetSuite changing, um, that they're changing and how they support partners and how much work they might provide to partners. So we should be more, a lot more reliant on our own ability to find clients who are interested in NetSuite. That would be a major change. Another downturn. Like, so the start of this yeah. year was obviously a lot yeah. slower. Pandemic, like we've had quite a few yeah. challenges already like i don't actually think we've had a normal year so we find it very hard to budget because yes you know, second year the pandemic happened so we then then after that just next we went crazy selling so it was like then the following year wasn't like that because everyone had bought the system so it was a bit slower than the economy yeah so it's been it's been tough <laughs> so yeah, you know, know, what's gonna you know what we learned and what we should have hired more people ahead of the work Late last year, we're like, we're finally in a position to do that. Plan to build like all these key people and key roles. Then you've got the global interest yeah. rates going up, which meant less spending, less like funding from VCs and PEs into businesses to spend on finance transformation. Then you know, that was even doubled down in the UK with like the Liz Trust budget. So yeah. we're like, okay, maybe we can ride through this wider UK economic issues because the fintech space is a bit, runs on its own kind of economic. Um, 
path. And then you had the Silicon Valley Bank crisis when 60% of our clients bank with them. So they're not going to pay any bills they've got and no one will be buying anything. I remember that Saturday morning in March playing golf thinking, I think it's all over by Monday. <laughs> Thankfully, HSBC <laughs> fixed it. But then, yeah, it's been a slowdown. Everyone's more nervous to invest and we just hired people to get ahead of it. So now we'll mix match on our capacity and headcount versus the work that was coming yeah. in. So. Great. Brilliant. You all right for just a couple of quick fire questions? Might want to do things in there. There might be something else that comes out. So if if I'll, I'll ask each of you separately, but Stephen, if you were to go back to your younger self, what advice would you give yourself? Back myself with the ideas, like take yeah. a risk, because I think Stephen and I have been quite good at working out problems and solving them, and there's people want to work with us because of it. Yeah. Maybe I didn't have the confidence to think people would want to buy a service I offered one day. Yeah. I actually was going to say the exact same. Sorry, good night. Yeah, I, I, I'm really <laughs> pessimistic. And I remember right at the start, like speaking to a recruiter who told us our idea was never going to work. I've never been so, I can remember how devastated we were after this call. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I would always be questioning myself. And so, yeah, having yeah. that confidence would have been, yeah. been good. Good. Excellent. Um, any, any books or podcasts or other learning resources that you'd like to? point out for other entrepreneurs Stephen any books I actually don't listen to anything I need to when I'm not working I need to de-stress I've got a young family as well as yeah. this, at the same time of starting this so I listen to football podcasts and uh, other things that are not business so I'm probably the worst person to ask this question so how do you how do you de-stress how do you de-stress what works for you Maybe. Play, play golf as I just video yeah. games, anything to kind of just turn off my brain because as yeah. Ross mentioned as well, I, I'm even the worst for it. I'm constantly thinking of like issues. I find it very hard to switch off my brain. Yeah. And so anything Brilliant. I can to do that, fluffy, All right. fluffy stuff, football, things like that. What about you, Ross? Any any learning resources you'd like to point out? Um, I sort of really like the psychology of how humans think. And so sort of my downtime, but still learning is like, books like that um yeah oh, i can't remember the, the sapiens book and you know, oh, by, yeah. those type of books about how, how we how we work and how we think are interested in and you can apply it to work and dealing with people as well yeah. um and they are sort of like into the politics yeah. quite controversial over here in the uk always so much going on so i kind of like switch off listening to politics podcasts um <laughs> yeah all right good um any bits of technology apps or things that you found particularly useful obviously you've mentioned click up already as being key within the within the business and obviously that's that's sweet itself but what any anything on your phones any apps that you have found particularly useful we use box for our like just uh for holding documents yeah um oh, i found much more click up click up was just one of the best things we use it for so much um yeah. it was just happened to have it come across it just before we started and i just couldn't i was recommending it to someone else from my friends there um the other day so i would highly recommend that and and we have we used that for everything within the business right ross um i uh, sort of yeah, try to switch off from technology there's one i've got called opal which you can sort of manage what apps you can see at certain times, what notifications come through. So you kind of set up what about yeah. these apps, whitelist these apps. So that sort of stops you being tempted nice. to open up Teams or Outlook on the weekend, um, stop notifications coming through out of hours, just to bring you that sort of mental break from work. That's been quite, quite good. Because um, you're always worrying and thinking about it and tempted to pick it up and check in. But okay. for your own well-being, you need to be able to unwind and switch off. Yeah, very good. Excellent. And Who's who's had the most influence on you as as leaders? Do you think any anyone you point to that's had the, a real strong influence on on how you lead, or an entrepreneur that you look up to? Yeah, I, I don't sort of really follow the um, mm. entrepreneurs and their style so much. Like, yeah, do do follow the stories of um, many of them that have been successful over here, but we just sort of forge our own way. Yeah, uh, learn different leadership styles from previous managers and things that worked well for me and what didn't, and try and come up with my own leadership yeah. style. Yeah, I, I I find a lot of probably you know, it might be a really bad generalization, but a lot of the top leaders are less empathetic than us. Maybe the opposite end of the scale, and so a lot of it doesn't really apply to our mindset. 
Yeah. There's not a lot of what I read if I'm reading like Amazon book or things like that. I'm like, there's no way I could have done that. Like, that just wouldn't sit with us. Um, yeah, I remember so- you saying how um yeah he just found Amazon to send out like a question mark email to his staff and they're always kind of like panicking when something goes wrong and it's not really us. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to just rely on our own judgment, but it helps when you got a business partner. We bounce stuff off the off, our, off and our other friends as well. So. But I did quite like Richard Branson's approach from reading his books. He seemed to be more of an empathetic leader than others that I've followed. Very good. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for taking part in Scale Up Radio today. So thank you, Steve and, and Ross. If people would like to get hold of either of you or find out more about the company, or um, how how's the best way for them to, to find out about Macrofin? You can go to our website. So it's macrofin.co.uk. M A C R O F I N. Um, we've got a support. Uh, okay, if you can submit a form through that. We'll respond the same day or follow us on LinkedIn. We're sort of regularly posting about the activity that we're doing, um, successful client go lives, webinars that we might be attending, or events that we're running. So you can always come along to one of those to learn more about the NetSuite ecosystem and making that transition, or, to, or just have a chat to us about if you want to help set up your own professional service consulting business. Brilliant. Super. Thank you very much. So Stephen Campbell and Ross Latter, thank you very much indeed for being my guest on Scallop Radio today. Thanks. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. And if you're building and scaling your own business, you might well be interested in our book, The Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a practical handbook around scaling a business in a structured way way and you can order a copy on all your favorite online retailers including an audio version or you can find it and other supporting resources on our website www.esusgroup.co.uk that's esusgroup.co.uk which is e-s-u-s-g-r-o-u-p.co.uk This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.